This is Julian, and I'm here with Teal Swan. And uh, if you don't know who she is, I'll just put a link to your YouTube channel here below. Uh, I first found out about you actually a year or two ago um, with that video, actually, like Emotional Vampires. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just absolutely loved it. And what I really, really loved about your work is uh, just the detailed explanation of these kind of, you know, from an outsider's perspective, like woo-woo-y type of concepts or stuff that people don't really, you know, are aware of. And you just break them down very straight line, straightforward. It's like there's this, this, this. And uh, the detail was just, you know, amazing. So absolutely loved it. And then just watched a ton of videos after that. And uh, also just the general presence that you have in your videos. You know, it's like, you know, if you're watching this, go check out one of her videos. Like the presence just being very still. Like you can tell you've done a lot of work on yourself. Um, yes. So, no, th thank you for doing this video. And, um, yeah, I mean, what I thought we could talk about here is uh, kind of explore, you know, like like seeking happiness externally and the big trap of, uh, you know, kind of that angle there. And this is something I've personally noticed. You know, I've been teaching dating advice for men for years now. And uh, a lot of people that I've, you know, worked with come into this and they want to be, you know, successful with women. They either want a lot of women or a girlfriend or a match. And uh, they're kind of coming at this from this angle of being very incomplete and seeking happiness through those external things. So it's like, if I finally get, you know, a girl, I'll, I'll feel complete. Uh, if I finally get a lot of girls, I'll be able to look cool. My friends will approve of me. If they love me, then it'll allow me to love myself. And, uh, and they really come at this again. There's that video I made on like emotional vampires where you just kind of see like the, you know, without criticizing like this black hole in their eyes and it's like leeching, leeching, and obviously it never works. And what they have to realize, and that's like the first step is, stop seeking happiness externally, uh, become internally fulfilled from there, and then, you know, you can find a match on a, you know, a more healthy level. So if we okay. could kind of dive into that, that'd be awesome. Okay. Well, first we have to acknowledge the fact that it's, this whole idea of finding happiness internally is highly theoretical. What I mean by theoretical is it's, it works. It's a universal truth. But when you come up to, up to somebody who's in a space where they are trying to find happiness externally and you say find it internally, you've basically just told them to go find a unicorn. That's <laughs> true. Because they're like, well, okay, great. Well, I don't know how to do that because it doesn't exist within me. So what I would say is um, actually quite interesting. It's that you have to go into whatever it is you're trying to escape from. So if you've got a, a state of trying to get something externally because you want completion, there's a state of emptiness within. Yes. So the emptiness is where we have to go. So this is the time period in our life, and it's the spiritual deepening that's the result of, of us being willing to, instead of go chase something which is trying to get us away from something else, which is really the condition of the world, we go in the direction of what we're trying to get away from. So it's straight into the eye of the storm. So the way to imagine this, I think, for people mentally, is to imagine that in their life, all of their movements towards what they want is essentially a movement to get away from a, a cyclone that's following them. So imagine that tornado chasing you. And for whoever you are, that tornado could be a different thing. So for one person, it could be emptiness. For one person, it could be a sense of uh, lack of self-worth. For another person, it could be a sense of failure. And that cyclone essentially chases you everywhere, and it inspires expansion. So when you feel that, that cyclone, you're basically saying, okay, I'm going away from that towards what I want. But a lot of the painful conditions on this earth is the fact that when you keep going for that, it's always because you're trying to get away from something. And that is inherently a state of pain. So what we have to be willing to do, and trust me, you'll get to the point, everyone will, where they get into their life enough trying to find the things that they think will make them happy. It doesn't work. Where they're just like, you know what, screw it, I'm never going to be happy. And so it's almost like, I'm sick of running from the cyclone. Fine, screw it, let it kill me. So once you get to that point is when life starts to get really good because you basically turn in the opposite direction. You walk straight into the eye of the storm, basically. And then when you have faced down those particular energies, and by face down, that's a fairly aggressive statement. It's more like you're learning how to be fully present with those aspects of yourself. It's almost like the light of consciousness will burn off the storm. So if you, you can imagine it like fog instead of like a cyclone, if you like. And you know how when, when sunlight hits that fog, the fog dissipates. Yes. So that's what happens when you bring the light of consciousness into an aspect of your psyche, which one could consider an absence or a lack or which is most of what's motivating us to move forward. And so it's divine presence, essentially, which is just the energy of your own consciousness that enables these aspects to not exist. And then instantly you are fulfilled from within. 
and when you're going to do things with it, it's not like then you become this like couch potato that doesn't need anything, doesn't want anything, but your wanting it does not carry the suffering tone that it did once because it's not a compulsion away from something. So it's more like divine inspiration. It's the difference between escapism and inspiration. Yeah, yeah, I love that. It's it's the whole like you you're unhappy when you don't have it too, just kind of building on this, and you're unhappy when you get it. And guys yeah. realize that like they actually get it, and they're like, well. I'm still, yeah, not fulfilled. And uh, what I actually tell them to do is follow the trail of whys. So it's like, why exactly? It's like getting to that eye of the storm. So it's like, why exactly do you want this? Oh, you yes. know, I want to be popular. Why? Why? Yes. Why? 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 Yes. And then they get to it. And uh, and then, yeah, they really have to face it. And as you said, they realize, well, you know, there is no point. It's like you're kind of just there. It's like, so now what? And uh, yeah, I love that too because then it's not that neediness. It's like you realize like, I mean, and this is my perspective, like, there is no point to anything. So it's like, what would you want to do to just make this enjoyable? Like it's coming from a place of just inspiration, expansion, you just wanting to do it, just why not? Versus needing or trying to like take, it's not a grasping feeling. So, so I yeah, that's really, really good. I think um, that's a beautiful thing that you just said when you said that you encourage people to think about the world as if there's no point, because we could make that mean there's no point, there's no meaning to life, there's no reason to be here, or we could make it mean if there's no point, I get to add the point that I want to add. Exactly. Yeah, I view it like detention. It's like we're all stuck here, and uh, you know, you can just <laughs> check out early, you can slack off, you can you know, do whatever you want, and it's like, what will make this the most enjoyable experience? And at least my personal point, like boiling it down to it, was expansion. That, that'd yeah. be the word, and expansion in every way, be it, you know, say, interacting with different human beings, like on a micro level, like expansion, in a relationship on a deeper level, even making these videos here, like we both make them, for me that's expanding and sharing and it's helping people so it's win-win, but even from a more selfish perspective, it's like that's the feeling that makes you internally like the happiest. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's really good. Um, the, the other one too that I really noticed is uh, like victim mentality, mm. where uh, you know, it's like you come into this and you, you kind of feel like cut off from everyone else, like why is it so hard for me, why is this happening to me? And once you're caught in that spiral, you just keep going down and uh, you try to numb it, you know, with like external stimulus, be it like television, drinking, drugs, even sex in a way. And uh, I I'm curious about your perspectives on that. Like, what are your thoughts on why that happens or how someone could snap out of that cycle there? Well, if you want, the, the being only does things which benefits it. And this is one of the most difficult part about healing any aspect of yourself is you have to acknowledge that the things that are causing you pain are actually benefiting you in some way, but it's a highly subconscious way. So when we look at victim mentality, what we find is that the people who succumb to it are addicted to the idea of goodness. So all that is is an ego that wants to be good versus bad. It's highly innocent if you want to know the truth. But by becoming a victim and by spiraling, I get to be good. So the ego is getting something out of it. So it doesn't have much motivation to change that, especially if you're looking at a person who deep down has this belief that there's something wrong with them or that they're evil or inherently bad. That person will be a victim mentality for the rest of their life, unless they change it. <laughs> so, so we have to recognize within ourselves what it is that we're doing when we're doing that. This, this is me trying to get my goodness. So how else could I get my goodness? I mean, it's really that simple. How else could I feel like I'm a good person than doing this thing where I need, because like if you're in victim mentality, then that essentially means you have to have a bad guy. That's the problem with the ego, which is really inherently, it feeds off of polarity, but anytime you've got an ego that is feeding off of a polarity like goodness, it needs a bad guy to exist. And so that's another way you can get yourself out of it by realizing that if you're stuck in that addiction to goodness by being a victim, you will be surrounded by bad guys for your whole life because you need it for your ego to exist. You know? Yeah. That gets a lot of women out of it. I think it could probably get a lot of men out of it, but a lot of women, they do that. They keep getting in relationships with the bad boys because it's the only way for them to feel their own virtue. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that victim one is huge. Um, another one, too, that I'd say to kind of snap out of it is I call it like embracing being part of a larger whole. Like one of the big things that just keeps reinforcing this cycle of just kind of being repressed or trapping yourself within yourself like cutting off like oh it's so hard for me i'm this hard you know it's like you're the hero of this this victim hero in a way is yeah. um is realizing that everyone is like you you know it's like we tend to take our insecurities our wounds it's like these unique wounds like you know i'm just so special because of this and you latch onto it and there's that saying like the more personal the wound the more universal the wound once you realize like oh my god like everyone else has this you know everyone's dealing 
with the same type of issues I have. I'm no longer that special. And just knowing that, that you're not alone and you're not just cut off from the pact, for me, for me at least, that helps a lot. It's like, oh, it's like I'm part of this larger thing. And uh, yeah, it's like unity over self. Yeah. I agree. So we, we have to ask ourselves when we're stuck in that, that sort of why only me thing, why do I need it to be only me? That's true. That's very, very true. <laughs> yeah, that and, and another interesting too is just um, getting a, uh, like a bigger circle of concern. It's like it, it's, a, it's a very petty like, way of thinking, like my problem, me, 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 me. And just one way to snap out of it is like, well, how can I, first of all, like say help someone else until you get out of your head or how can, even in terms of like uh, something you're trying to accomplish, like a certain goal, some of your concerns are like a lot bigger. It's like you, you don't have time. It's like you don't have the luxury because it really is like a luxury in a way to kind of slip into that little petty state of mind there. So would you suggest random acts of kindness? Yeah, obviously, yeah. Kindness for sure. Um, yeah, for, for me, it's just like getting out of your head. Like, how can I help someone? Like random acts of kindness, um, even in a, how to say it, in a more like material way. It's like, what's this person's issue? And like, you kind of start dealing with that. However, the trap there too is to then kind of get caught up in that. And then you take on the role of, oh, look at me, I'm helping everyone else. I'm this martyr. victim, the more exactly. So it's it's a fine line between the two there. The martyr is a victim role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, for, for me personally, I mean, this, the, the whole like stop seeking, you know, kind of linking to victim, but also back to the stop seeking help, happiness externally. Um, I experienced it too, where, I mean, I was recently in like this media scandal and uh, <laughs> be, before then, yeah, it was, it was ridiculous. But before then, I really reached that point where, because because I fell into it, like just with women, then I got out of it. Like, okay, I don't need, you know, it's like, it's coming from a healthier place. Then I built upon that, but it just keeps, you know, sneaking back. Yeah. And, uh, and it subtly snuck back on me where before that, I remember thinking like, from my perspective, I thought I had it all. It's like, here I am traveling, teaching this, doing what I love, et cetera, et cetera. But it came more of like this ego place. And, and then I was thinking like, well, now what? And as soon as that thought popped in, it's like, I knew it was bad. It's like, now what? And uh, the, what I really learned going through it all, because a lot of that was stripped away, is I was pretty much left with, you know, nothing but myself. And then it was like a lot of introspection. It's like, well, that doesn't bring happiness. Like, why can't you feel happy now? And uh, just kind of realizing that too, like as soon as you place your, your sense of worth on anything external, and, and this is my perspective, uh, you, you're bound to deform a certain ego and just lose it at some point. Because yeah. in like the physical world, like it's duality all the time. So even if it does go well for a bit, you're either latched onto it and it's bound to go down. So for me, it was kind of like this cleansing of just like, whew, let go of all of that, and, you know, and on a more spiritual level and just like come back to the center, core values, and uh, getting back to that sense of expansion and sharing in a way. So yes. yeah, yeah, that was very interesting. Um, yeah, I was curious, building on that too, it's like, what are some of the ways you'd suggest going about, you know, for, for people watching, like you'd suggest about coming back to that center, being in a way happy, no matter what your situation is just right now. Like for someone, if they're in like a tough spot, what would you recommend to them? Go into the pain. I mean, it depends how low of a vibration you're in. It's quite easy to go into a state of gratitude. I mean, that's one of the best things that people can do. You actually, it's an impossibility to be in victim mentality and to recognize positive aspects of your life, appreciative notice. What if someone says, well, there's nothing? Absolutely. Then they that's the person see. that I would take into their pain. See, like, that's the, the people that I like to work with, mm -hmm. honestly. That's my favorite demographic because when you're at that type of a state, that means that your pain body essentially has called you deeply back into it for the sake of the deepening of your own spiritual practice. So that's when we go into the pain instead. Nice, How, nice. Can you be present with it? Mm -hmm. And what you notice is, is you don't really have to do much. It's like, I mean, people don't understand what true presence is because we're such a doing species. We don't realize that by, like, let's say you wake up and you've got an emotion, a heavy emotion going on, which is the case for most of us that don't enjoy life. So you get that heavy emotion. You close your eyes and you sink into the feeling. So instead of trying to use that feeling to go eat ho-hos or uh, whatever it is that you do to escape from it, you sink deeply into it as if it's your teacher. The pain itself becomes the teacher. It's a transformative experience. Pain transforms you. So as you're present with it, you are essentially going into a state of allowing that is deep enough that it opens up the crown chakra. That's what you watch with people. And then insight and intuition will drop into the being. And that's when you get those really good aha moments where it's like, 
oh, this really doesn't matter much. I can let go of it completely. Because until then, let go is yet again more theoretical spirituality, right? It's just what people say, but how do you let go type of a thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like it too with the going into the pain because it's it gets rid of all that resistance too. It does. Uh, where it's like, I just don't want to feel pain. I don't want to feel pain. And then you have it and then it just keeps fueling it. So kind of embracing it. That's what we got to realize. Like, I don't want to have it. I don't want to have it, but it's there. So yeah. what the hell is the point? Like, even if you try to focus positively, you're just going to be pulling against something. Yeah. So, so really what I like to teach people is the one, two step. So the first step when we are dealing with the unwanted or with anything painful is we become intensely present with it as if it's an alarm bell saying, ding, 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 we need to pay attention. So we become intensely present with that, and then that lifts the fog. We Something else comes into our consciousness. So there were a great many um, therapists way back when who believed that any time you had those intense emotions or anxiety, it was something in the subconscious mind wanting to surface to the consciousness. In the spiritual world, we call that a, a phase of enlightenment. So if we treat pain that way, and then you've got that aha moment where the fog clears, then... That is the point in time to focus on creating something. And you'll naturally start to feel that sort of sunlight feeling of your own soul coming in and inspiring you towards action. So that's the point at which to focus on the life you want to lead. Mm -hmm. But you're doing it this time from a space of pure inspiration instead of from a space of, I want this thing because I so don't want this other thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, what would you recommend for someone to to keep themselves in that headspace there? where? They kind of like clear the fog, as you mentioned, but then as they, as they often notice, like you easily snap back to it because you're in a way addicted to it because you've been in that other, you've been in the fog for so long. Um, do you recommend like any daily rituals, daily practices or just curious about your perspective on it? I don't really because the thing is, is that most of us, we want to get into these high vibrational spaces or stay there because we're so resistant to the lower vibrational spaces. So what you find when you talk to people who are what we would consider to be awakened is that they have no resistance to feeling anything including pain and it's that lack of resistance to it that creates a condition where you're you're not really sinking as high or as low so to begin with before you reach this like beautiful kind of transformative stasis you, uh, stasis is the wrong word because it implies non-movement but you achieve a kind of um, transcendence you, you could say over the ups and downs is that you literally intensely let yourself go into it I mean, I, I've, I really, it would be a very rare person if I shook their hand and they said, how do I stay in this good feeling space? And it wouldn't be because they're so, so resistant to going down again. And that's yes. a guarantee you're going down again. So what I help people to do is to culture the willingness to feel. Mm. So, so like, in, and this is a, a big shift in consciousness when it comes to our uh, spiritual world, especially in self-help world, which is most of teachers so far. They have been dedicated, intensely dedicated, to the idea of feeling better. So we're not trying to do that anymore. We're trying to get better at feeling. So it's almost like, I feel pain, so it is. I feel joy, so it is. There's a non-attachment to the feeling itself. And that, just, the vir just by virtue of the non-attachment, you come into alignment with your soul aspect, which is intensely in alignment. That's those good feeling spaces, those that ins that inspiration, that impulse, essentially, that you want to feel. That's what we all want, right? We, so <laughs> by by developing non-resistance to feeling, by becoming intensely willing to feel even pain, you're in a state of non-resistance. Then you're in full allowing of your soul. And then you're you're in alignment. That's what a person, I mean, you can feel those types of people. You sit down in front of them and you're just like, you know, just by being around that energy, it almost calls you like a beacon back to yourself. Bam, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really, really deep. And uh and it and it kind of also in a way it's like letting go of, you know, these these rea these like mythical realities like, you know, I never want to feel pain. I always want to be in control. You know, like people really idealize that. It's like they latch on to this reality of no pain or of a hundred percent control or of uh they always want to like figure everything out. But once you can as you said, like let go of that and just realize it's okay and in a way it's natural, then you can actually start relaxing. Exactly. And I like to ask people relative to pain, what does pain mean to you? Because what we have to realize is that it's not pain itself that we have an issue with. I mean, pain in and of itself is just a sensation. Mm -hmm. When we get into real trouble with pain is when we make it mean fill in the blank. 
Yeah, yeah. It's like you don't fear the events; you fear you fear the thoughts that those like events provoke. Or like when you're pain, it's like it's actually the thoughts; it's not the actual feeling in and of itself. Oh yeah, <laughs> and we we have got pain, especially in the Western culture. We have associated pain with something that is wrong, mm -hmm. and and then wrong and right is an issue for us, right? Because we get punishment and reward. That's how we're raised: punishment and reward. So it's almost like the minute I feel pain, something's gone wrong. There's going to be a punishment. And that's really, that cycle is what's got us all panicked about it. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, know, that's, I, I, I link that too. Even if, you know, from the, the dating aspect, like people fear in a way not having chemistry with someone so intensely. But once you realize like, again, it's like, it's like those realities, like no pain or like zero rejection. But once they understand like you're not naturally meant to necessarily have like chemistry with everyone, that's fine. They're like, oh, like in a way it's just taking away all this pressure. It's like yeah. you just have to find a way of just like instead of barreling through to something, you just like peel away all the layers. Is that and that that's really profound what you just said because you just defined exactly what I feel like spiritual practice is all about. It's not about getting somewhere. It's that you innately in and of yourself are a completely in alignment being and there's just a lot of layers in between you and the actualization or realization of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So our job is not to become something more. Our job is to realize what we are already. Yeah, it's like aiming for that finish line of being enlightened. It's like, if I can just barrel through and make it up there, like that's a lot of people. I love to encourage people that if they're in that mode where they want to, you know, live a life of more joy rather than the roller coaster so much, that they need to take a look at their life and actually start implementing steps which will allow them to do that. I like to encourage people to pick one spiritual practice. Now I know that somebody who's been watching you or me, we probably give out how many tools per, per week? It's like you end up with just a litany of them and then it gets really super overwhelming for people mm -hmm. and then they, they're looking at all of them all these tools and all these techniques and they're like I can't apply all of these at once it's not possible and so the message that I would send is you don't have to the point is you gotta find the one that resonates with you and stick to it yeah. practice it until it becomes second nature yeah yeah no that's that's big too and uh, I see it in all industries it's like you go down the like the theory junkie route of it all too it's like you, you want to do it right. Like, that's a big one, too. It's like people always want to do it right. And another, you know, those realities you have to kind of let go is like being so afraid of starting off the wrong way and just learning through trial and error. So the, the way we cope with that is you, you read the manual beforehand. Like in most things, like, am I doing it right? Like even in terms of living my life, am I living it the right way? So you look up the manual and um, with these here, it's like the only way you can really learn them is through practice, is through implementing them. And uh, once you just start reading or watching all these videos and you get caught in that cycle of hoping to reach that finish point of, okay, I got it now to do it right. It one, it'll never happen. And secondly, you just get so overwhelmed because you're, you're learning without applying. I know. Don't you wish they said that to you? Well, the, we kind of knew that before coming in, but it's almost like, I wish that somebody was sitting there being like, you know what? You're in uncharted territory. Nobody knows what this is about. <laughs> so have fun trying to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. That's the best frame. Yeah. It's like, have fun, just have fun and just try and just enjoy the process of doing it. And, um, uh, another one too is, and this is a trap I noticed a lot of my clients fall into is the, the just wanting to be inspired. And, uh, and, and this is actually a trend, even on most social media, it's like you, you know, if you look say on Facebook, there's a lot of people now posting, um, these self-help, uh, pictures, like you can do it, someone climbing up a cliff and that's awesome because it's bringing a lot more awareness. However, the, the trap and pattern I kind of see happening is people love it just for that feeling of. Oh, that's inspiring. Oh, that's a good idea without actually applying it or doing anything with it. And I mean, it's a lot better than, you know, watching, say, television or something. It's better than, you know, listening to noise, but, you know, they're missing that essential piece. It's like just being inspired for the sake of being inspired is, you know, worthless in a way. It's like you have to implement it. Even if, say, someone watches your videos, I'm like, that's a great idea. And then they go back to their lives. It's like, you know, it's like you have to do it. It's like the, the two components go hand in hand. I completely agree with you. I actually had a whole talk about that a week ago. So. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. So, yeah, I mean, we covered a lot of, uh, you know, aspects here of uh, victim mentality, you know, seeking joy externally, some of the traps people fall into when trying to, you know, learn this or, or achieve this state here. Um, you know, before we wrap, are there any last thoughts you'd want to add on to it? Or any last words, like a saying or... Yeah, I feel, I feel like one of the... I mean, have fun with life. Mm -hmm. And if it's not fun, just feel the not funness. 
because whatever is happening is correct. That's what I would explain to somebody. We get into pain when we think that what's happening is not supposed to be happening. Yes. So if we, if we approach the life from the philosophy of whatever's happening is supposed to be happening, that opens up a window. You can kind of feel the confines, you know, if you, I mean, just let's go with just the sensation. Mm -hmm. When I think whatever's happening is not supposed to be happening, it's almost like I'm trapped, right? The minute I think, okay, maybe this is supposed to be happening, it's like somebody does open a door. So it's almost like breath enters the lungs, and then at that particular point, you can look for the benefit of the situation. Why might this be happening? And I feel like that's really a critical space to be in because we're walking through life trying to get everything correct. We already have a preconceived notion about what correct means. And when life doesn't go according to plan, which is pretty much always, then we're in a state of hell. So that, that would be my suggestion. Yeah, I, I love that. It's like just embrace every experience too. And is there's always a plus side and something you can learn from it in a, a way it'll benefit you if you're smart enough to see it. So it's like finding that angle there. And with the have fun with life, it's like, yeah, have fun with the stuff that, you know, from a, how to say it, a conditioned standpoint, you could view as bad. It's like, have fun with it. You know, so if something's bad, like have fun, embrace, embrace, embrace. And uh, actually, one, one last thing. Um, what are your thoughts, too? Because this is something I notice is, uh, and, and this could be a trap if you're in victim, you know, mentality, trying to help someone else, is the comparison game. Where it's like you're looking at someone else and you're like, oh, why do they have it way easier than me? Why am I not like that? What? It's like this wishing to be someone that you're not. Like if I boil it down to it, it's like that's really what it is. It's like you don't like yourself and you're just like wishing you're someone that you're not. Uh, just curious about your, your thoughts on that. I have an interesting view on, on uh, comparison thinking because I feel like it's a really beneficial tool to use sometimes deliberately. It's when the tool begins to use us that we fall into a seriously negative pattern. So more so for inspiration purposes versus self-hate purposes. Well, I mean, ironically, you can, you can look at somebody who has it worse. Mm-hmm. And even though the ego will get off on superiority in that particular circumstance, you can use it to make yourself feel a little bit better. I mean, that's a tool. True. And it seems sort of funny for me to be um, explaining it that way. Another thing you could do, competition, healthy competition is actually super, super good. To, to strive to match or excel past the people who have, have made it before is what, ex what creates a lot of expansion. So there's a real healthy form of competition as well. But when it gets into a state where we're basically self-hating through our comparison that's the point at which there's a serious issue that we've got going obviously where we need to become intensely conscious of why we're doing it especially the positive reason behind doing that yeah so like, can you think I mean I'd be curious let's because you can put yourself probably in the mindset of a lot of men mm -hmm. if you if you were comparing yourself let's say you've got the, a guy right let's just pretend you're somebody who's like got a Ferrari or you're around somebody, want to be somebody who's got a Ferrari, who's like multi-millionaire, who's got the super hot, su supermodel girlfriend, right? Yeah. What's the positive reason why you might be telling yourself, I'm crappy compared to him? Well, the, the plus side is you could be inspired, but the, the first thing I would say is it's not about looks or money and to really get out of that paradigm there. I know you'd say that. Yeah, no, because, <laughs> no, even, even from that perspective, it's like no matter how let's just say from a superficial standpoint, good looking or how much money you have, um, there's always going to be, there's like, there's always a bigger fish. It's like, you, there's always going to be someone better than you and it's like this never ending process. Oh yeah, so here's the thing, ready for this? Yeah. What if that's okay? When that causes us pain is when we think that that's not okay. There will, there will always be a bigger fish. So there's two ways to get out of it, right? The first way is the way that you've been teaching, which is, which is basically you look at, you take a look at that and you realize how to find the happiness within. The other way, is to become okay with the fact that it's never going to end. And if you become okay with that, then it literally, it's actually, it causes that same sort of sense of relief where you're just like, all right, so it's always going to be the next thing. So getting to that thing doesn't mean as much. Mm -hmm. But then you can always let yourself basically attain what it is you want to attain. Because this is the reason to do it that way. Um, you can't unwant something. Have you noticed that? Sure. You run into a lot of problems with this. So, like, let's say a guy really does want that. Like, we can examine all the reasons that he does want that, but he may still want it. So, if he wants it still, then we got a little issue because no amount of spiritual teaching is going to make him unwant it. He's just going to bury it probably subconsciously. So, it's almost like get it, let them get it, so that when they get to that thing, they become even more intensely aware of what they really want. So, a lot of people aren't even aware that they really want happiness or they really want fulfillment until they achieve those things they think they want. Yeah, yeah, you have to go through the cycle. Um, well, actually what I'd say is I agree with this and building on it even further, it's like, accept that there's a bigger fish. However, realize too, that the only, 
what I would say, it's like the only unique value you have to offer, because that's really the standpoint they come from. It's like, oh, I can offer her the lifestyle, the money, the looks. The only, <laughs> the only value you really have to offer, as corny as it sounds, is your own uniqueness. It's, it's like, true. That's really what it is. So That's what you can't get over when a relationship ends, right? That's oh, no, true. they used to like oranges, too. I know. It's like, yes, yeah, that person's uniqueness. And, and even on a more micro level, like, people always want the the pickup lines, let's just say. And the reason being is it's the same as the Ferrari or the money. It's like they want the more interesting line. When in reality, it's not the line. It's like you can go up and say, hey, how's it going? And most likely, you know, the other person's heard that before, but she's never heard your version of it. And then it's like your focus is on making that version the best version she's ever heard. And that's your own value there. So, so in a way, it's coming to terms with it and like letting go of that. Also realizing that, you know, uh, attraction for a woman is very different than, say, for a man. It's like for a man, we're, you know, basing it on visual cues you know, a lot of the time. Women, it's more on behavioral cues. So maybe, you know, from a first impression standpoint, you know, she'll be like, oh, okay, well, that guy's like this. But once they start interacting and she can see the behaviors behind it, she's like, oh, and she'll, you know, base that assumption on something real and oftentimes change it. So the Ferrari and the money don't matter. It's like it's not an excuse, what I say. And then, uh, yeah, it's just really getting back to that core of, like, offer the best kind of uniqueness. And yes. even linking back to the other one, too. Because I teach this too, I'm like, don't do it for the validation. It's like, you probably realize getting into this, like a lot of guys, it's like, if I can only just get one good reaction and then they get it and then they become numb to it. It's like, hey, what's the next thing? The next thing. So at some point, it's like you get to that point, as you mentioned, where it's like, okay, it's never ending. I'm here. I have it. And then you go back. But you have to go through that to realize it. Totally true. So let's go to the positive reasons why somebody might be comparing themselves. And what I mean by positive reasons is it's, it'll seem real negative. So, I, and I want to make a lot of men aware of this because they definitely do it. If you're comparing yourself essentially to somebody else who's succeeding and looking at your own failure, it actually gets you out of responsibility. That's what we have to understand. A lot of us want to, a release of pressure more so than we want to take the responsibility for our own lives. So if you're comparing yourself next to somebody you're convinced is going to be ten times better than you, it lets you off the hook because failure is is like it's not as it's not as much uh, responsibility or pressure. That's true. Yeah, yeah. If there was someone else exactly like them doing it well, it would like you know shine that spotlight on their shortcomings. Like you should be doing it. You can't have this excuse, and it in a way gives them permission to do it too. This is why also a lot of you know guys are held back from putting themselves out there. Is uh, you know if by societal norms they're not say good looking or have a lot of money. They don't see many other guys like them doing it. And so it's like, well, if no one else is doing it, I don't have the permission to do it. Um, so kind of snapping out of that paradigm there as well. I like that. <laughs> nice. Um, cool. I mean, yeah, that, that was awesome. Yeah, thanks for, for doing this, uh, this call here. Uh, people are going to love it. And uh, yeah, once again, I'll put a link to your YouTube channel here below. And uh, as always, until next time.